I'll begin here in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. I'm going to begin with an introduction and uh, uh, spend a few minutes in verses 1 and 2. So we'll begin with Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, where Solomon is continuing giving words of exhortation and instruction, and it's almost like Proverbs, giving Proverbs. And he says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. So this portion that we're going to be looking at tonight is uh, one that emphasizes living by faith. And Solomon is beginning, and you'll see this as we go through this uh, portion of Scripture and all, he's beginning um, uh, this particular portion by the use of two very basic illustrations. He's beginning first by speaking of a merchant, but he's also going to refer to a farmer. Now, obviously, Solomon was acquainted with trade and commerce, and he would be aware of the risks of both. So he's using this knowledge and experience to illustrate for us a life of faith. So when he begins in verse 1 by saying, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you'll find it after many days. Well, the first illustration begins with a merchant that is exporting produce. And this is the heart of what he's saying. He's saying faith-filled giving will produce future reward. So he uses the phrase, cast your bread. Casting bread upon the waters gives the impression that you're throwing it away. The word bread, though, it, it is important for us to note that the word bread can be translated not simply bread, but by the word seed or grain. So he's saying, cast your grain or the seed. Why would he say that instead of bread? Well, because uh, it matures and when it matures, it is reaped. And so nobody would throw grain or bread into a river because that would be wasteful. So the point he's making, and it's very practical, is in investing. Investing requires faith and trust that the investment will reap good results. And that's especially true in business, where beginning a business can be a very risky thing. So from a commercial perspective, it requires a kind of faith to start a business. Initial investments don't always pay off, and there's never really a guarantee of success. And so from that point of view, his words could encourage someone to take the chance. Now, every business person knows that nothing ventured is nothing gained. So to succeed in business, taking calculated chances will be necessary for success. So obviously, sending your merchandise via wooden ships is going to be a risky business. So, disbursement of finances will always involve risk, but the profits, he's saying, may flow back to you. So, it takes a kind of faith to invest with an, with an eye, if you will, on possible future returns. And, and not everyone can do that, and not every, everyone will do that. Why? Because it's unsure. Here's a little blast from the past for some of you. Most of you were probably either a baby or not even born at this time. In 1973, my mom, I had gotten out of the military. I had a little money put away. My mom wanted me to invest in a triplex in Anaheim. A triplex. Three little buildings. Little houses in Anaheim. I want you to think about it about today. But I, I said, no, it's too expensive. I don't want to buy three houses, three houses for $30,000. All right. Thank you so much for making me feel as bad as I do. I wasn't willing. I was not willing to take the chance. I, I thought I was throwing my, I was casting my bread upon the waters. I thought I was throwing my money away. Where am I going to get thirty grand? I didn't have thirty thousand. Well, son, you can get a loan. I don't want to take out a loan, but son, I'm telling you, Anaheim is a place you ought to invest. And I said no. Second thing, might as well dig a deeper hole. Second thing, I was in San Luis Obispo, just outside of it, by Lopez Lake, and there's a side road that can take you into the town, take you up north. 
And so I was going up this side road. A friend of mine and I, a couple of friends, I used to have a motorcycle, and we had taken a ride up to Slow. And so we're going up this side road, and off to the side of the road, out there close to, some of you may be familiar with the area, Lopez Lake, there, was a t there were 10 acres of land. <laughs> 10 acres for $10,000. Oh, stop it. <laughs> Sometimes financial gain will be the fruit of financial risk. Solomon is simply speaking from that perspective that it takes something to make something in the business world. It takes money. The phrase is it takes money to make money. Every business person knows that. You invest in order to get. But if you hold on and don't, then you reap nothing. And so it takes a step of faith for you to reach out and do something with the hope to gain some kind of gain from it. It's a merchandising thing. Now, obviously, I, I have to hasten to say this. There's a difference between presuming or presumption and genuine faith. You see, when you presume, you're just kind of taking the chance or a risk and think, oh, I'll be okay. I'm going to jump off the pinnacle of the temple and angels will hold me up. That's the kind of thing. So I'll take my money and I'll throw it. I just, I just met with some people who were discussing with me some, a plan that they have, and they were wanting me to be part of that on a personal level, just myself with, with uh, some funds that I might, might be able to invest in, and just, just did this. And I said, I'm not the guy who throws money away. I don't take that. I, I don't do that. It takes money to make money, they say. But there has to be a wisdom. You don't presume. Just because you invest, it doesn't mean you're going to get something. So I'm not saying, and Solomon is certainly not saying, that you should just do it and see what happens. No, you have to have faith-filled planning, prayerful planning. So what we do before you move out is you rely on the Lord and you pray. And when he, God gives you the sense, and he will, that you should uh, take that step, you will. Proverbs 16, verse 9 says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So spiritually, this would be an encouragement to trust the Lord to supply your need. Now, when you give your gift to the Lord, what we used to do, now they're just pushing buttons and all of that, you know, just sending it. Um, but there was a time when you would actually, and some still do, take something out of their wallet or write, write out a check. Um, and you drop it, we'll say, into the, the bucket that passes before you. It feels like you're throwing it away. Like, here, here it goes, you know. There goes my burrito. You know, I'm, I'm giving it away. <laughs> well, that's like throwing your grain. That's like throwing your bread on a river or an ocean and losing it. So giving's an act of faith. Trusting in the Lord's promises that he'll take care of you is an act of faith. And by the way, in that giving, it is one of the most tangible demonstrations of faith that you have. Because, because you're trusting the Lord for your daily bread. That's why the widow's might is such a powerful story. Because she gave all that she had to live on, Jesus said. He was not impressed with the ones who had substance that they could throw away, lose, and it doesn't matter. He said, this is somebody who gave away everything that she had to live on. That's why that's such a powerful uh, demonstration of faith. She trusted the Lord to take care of us. So some people think, well, giving to the Lord, well, that's wasting money. But giving reveals trust that God provides. Giving reveals a belief in his word because he's promised to do so. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, the word says, Honor the Lord with your possessions, with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty. Your vats will overflow with new wine. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. This I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. The word cheerful, by the way, is a Greek word that you get the word hilarious from. 
somebody who really enjoys giving to God with joy. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. In, in our church, when we began to receive offerings, I was sharing with uh, someone recently, some people recently, we didn't receive offerings for the first 11 years of our church. We didn't receive offerings. We had an agape box. And if people were led of the Spirit to give, they did. If they, they, if they didn't want to give, they didn't. We didn't pass a, a bucket or anything like that. And, and God provided for every single thing that we had. We, we were not receiving offerings when we bought the property here. And so we qualified to be able to make payments on property when we first bought it back in, nine, in 92, I think it was. We, uh, we qualified to buy this. It was a little over $3 million, and we were not receiving offerings. We have always trusted the Lord to provide, always. The reason we began to receive offerings, because all of you have probably been, almost all of you have been here uh, and have seen that we receive offerings. So it's a very simple story. I'll say it quickly. It's that I had gotten proud of the fact that we didn't receive offerings. And I had been at a meeting with several pastors in the area, and they wanted me, they told me, would you please receive the offering because they wanted us to combine with them to be in a, uh, an outreach. And they said, David, could you go up and receive the offering? And I said, no, I can't. Why not? I said, I never have. I said, I don't, we don't receive offerings in our church. And this pastor said, you, you what? And I said, we don't receive offerings. So he said, how, how do you pay your bills? I said, we don't. No, I, he said, how do you? <laughs> you just say God will pay it, and we send him a check. No, he said, how do you pay your bills? And I said, um, the people... The people give. We have agape buckets. They're not even buckets, agape boxes. He says, You don't receive an offering. How do you how do you receive how do you have any money coming in? And I said, and I'll never forget, I said to him, We teach them. We teach the Bible. And the Bible teaches us to give generously. So I don't have to pressure them. Well, I didn't realize it, but I was proud. I didn't realize it. And so the Holy Spirit convicted me and started saying, it's time to receive offerings. Why, Lord? Because you're not teaching the people that I bless them. You're not teaching them the word. You, you, and this is a, an actual kind of conversation. You're not teaching them that I bless them when they give. And you are stealing blessings from the people that you should be teaching that they might be blessed. And I said, oh. Well, that's just me. So one of my board members calls me up out of the blue, and he says to me, you know, Dave, the, the Holy Spirit has put it on my heart to tell you we need to start receiving offerings. And I said, no, we're not going to do that. Raul and I, Raul Reese and I, took a trip to India, and we traveled together, went to India. I'll never forget it. We were in southern India. It was a very, you know, there were no lights in the room that we were in. He, it was so hot, he was laying on the concrete floor. I still remember in the dark how he said, ow, what was that? Because something had bitten him. <laughs> Out of nowhere in the darkness, I hear his voice. He doesn't call me David. To this day, he doesn't. He calls me David. <laughs> David. I said, I said, what? God is saying to me to tell you, I'll never forget that. It's time to receive offerings. Out of the blue, Raul is not on my board. He knows nothing about me. So I took that as confirmation because my board member said it. Raul said it. The witness of two, I said, God, you're telling me something. And that's how we began receiving offerings. Not because we needed it. God has always provided. It's because I wasn't teaching the church the whole counsel of God. And so when we look at this, this is not a come on to receive an offering. Guys, got the buckets ready? No. <laughs> it's just the truth. God is able to make all grace abound to you. Now, moving on, verse 2 says, uh, Give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. And so this is an encouragement to generosity. Notice, give a serving to seven and also to eight. 
So he's saying make your finances, make use of your finances in a charitable way and be aware of those who are in need. If God has blessed you financially, he's saying be generous and care about other people. In verse 2, he says, you do not know what evil will be on the earth. You never know when bad times will come. So one day you yourself may need help and those you have helped may be there to be of help to you. In verse 3, if the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. If a tree falls to the south or the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it shall lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. What mysterious things he's saying here. So this brings us to the farmer. So nobody can perfectly predict or control weather. So that leaves the farmer at the mercy of nature. How is he going to deal with this? Well, he draws a contrast. Notice this with, he does a, uh, draws a contrast between clouds and trees. Now, clouds, obviously, are, are, are always passing through. They're constantly changing. You look up to the sky five minutes later, it's, it, it looks different. Sometimes the wind blows them over the land and it rains. Sometimes they hold no rain. And even if they did, you can't control the wind that is driving the clouds. That's the point. So these are always moving. They're not really stable. But in contrast, you have a tree, and the tree is rooted to the ground. So under normal circumstances, when a tree will fall, it remains where it fell. So it's a contrast between that which changes and that which does not change. And so the past, which would be a tree, cannot be changed. The present, which is a cloud, is available to us. So what is he saying? I don't know. No, he's saying, do not sit around waiting for ideal circumstances to present themselves. Verse 4, he who observes the wind will not sow, he who regards the clouds will not reap. Sitting around trying to predict perfect conditions will paralyze you. So sometimes we need to launch out in faith. And trust the Lord. I've known many a minister who reminds me of somebody who's in the center of the road and a car is going towards them. And they don't know whether to move to the right or the left, so they stand still and they get run over by the car. You can't be indecisive. There needs to be a time. If you're waiting on the Lord for him to lead you, obviously that's good. But if you just don't make decisions because you don't know what to do, that's not good. Going on, verse 5. As you do not know what is the way of the wind or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. Well, obviously, nobody understands completely the way of the wind, but this is where it's kind of interesting what he's saying because when you see, notice verse 5, the way of the wind. When you look at the word wind, the word wind in Hebrew, and this was written, the Old Testament written in, in Hebrew, is a, a word ruach. Ruach can speak of breath, but it also speaks of the natural wind. It can be speaking of the spirit of a living person. And so Ruach would be speaking in this context of a person's spirit. And so he's saying, um, no one knows how the human spirit is, is part of a, of a person. How does the spirit enter in to an embryo, making it a living being. How does that happen? And so that can remind us of something that took place in the ministry of Christ when he was speaking to a man who came to him by night, Nicodemus. You remember, the scripture says, and Nicodemus came to him by night. There used to be a show, Nick at Night, and it was about him. No, it wasn't him. I'm sorry. Anyway, Nicodemus. Master, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do the works that thou doest unless God is with him. Nicodemus says to him. Nobody knows why he came by night. There's so many different ideas as to why he would do so. Maybe he was busy. Maybe he didn't want to be seen. But the fact is he came to him by night. And he speaks to him. He's a master, a teacher. Jesus actually refers to Nicodemus as the teacher of Israel. He speaks of him as having a high esteem in the nation. He wasn't just some guy talking. This was a man who was a scholar, intellectual. He was somebody who was on the Sanhedrin. He was a very high-priority man. How is it that thou being a teacher of Israel, 
don't understand the things that I'm saying. Because Jesus said, the wind blows where it desires. And uh, you don't know where it originates. You don't know where it's going. So Jesus spoke to him a natural thing. What was he speaking of? He was speaking of wind. But he was using it in a particular way that was spiritual because he says, the one who is born of the Spirit, because that's when Jesus said a man must be born again to enter in or to see the kingdom of God. The one who is born of the Spirit is one who is moved by God himself because the Spirit dwells within us. And you're no longer what would be called a natural man. And so prior to the Holy Spirit giving us life, the Bible teaches us that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. We can be very religious. We can dress up the outside very well with very religious you know, clothing. But I've said this before. You, you can put a tuxedo on a chimpanzee too. But it's still a chimpanzee because it doesn't deal with your nature. It just makes the outside look okay. And there are a lot of people who look really good. I remember one, one Sunday morning coming to church and saying to the church, you know, I was wearing a T-shirt and sweater and all of that. And I said, you know, I said, uh, looks, it looks okay today, huh? My, t my sweater looks nice. And people, you know, they're so sweet. They lied and said, yeah, it looks nice. And I said, but you know what? I didn't iron my, my, my T-shirt. I just have the collar. I iron just around the collar. Everything. I said, if I took this off, it's all wrinkled like that, you know, because you're looking at the outside. And so you can look at people on the outside and they look good, but they're wrinkled T-shirts. <laughs> Underneath it, it's messed up. And so in order, in order for us to be okay, it's not the outer appearance at all. It requires the Spirit of God to transform us from the inside so that the outside now begins to conform in the way that we live to Jesus Christ. See, that's how that works. And so prior to the Spirit giving us life, uh, we have none. We are dead in trespasses and sin, and therefore we need the Spirit to give us life. So you don't know how a, a, a spirit, a, a child, you don't know how that child has the Spirit and all within him or the soul within him. And, uh, but the person who is not born again, that person um, is dead because you need life, and that's what the Spirit is representing here. So nobody completely understands how complex a human truly is. In Psalm 139, verses 14 through 16, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So only God knows the truth about how that actually takes place. You see, we can monitor the growth of a baby, but we don't understand how that's really working itself out. And because that's true, we trust that he has all things under control. The things that I can't understand, it's always wise just to leave them in his hands. In verse 6, In the morning sow your seed. In the evening do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. So work faithfully. Don't become lazy. Don't become neglectful at what you're doing. Sometimes you're going to start out in the morning. You're going to work until the evening. And so diligence at what you're doing will be necessary for your success. And just because you don't know the final results will not excuse you for not working. So, his counsel, regard life as a faith-filled adventure. Invest in today, and you'll reap benefits tomorrow. Like a farmer, sow your seed, and trust in God to bring the harvest. In verse 7, truly the light is sweet. It's pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, let him remember the days of darkness, for there'll be many. All that is coming is vanity. Thank you for that upbeat closing, Solomon. Life is a gift. Learn to enjoy it. It's a joy to wake up to bright sunshine and to simply be happy. My wife and I, Often we'll go get a cup of coffee. It'll be early, not real early, but early 
in the morning. And we, we, we say this quite often, she and I. She'll look around and she'll see the bright sunshine and she'll say, it's such a beautiful, it's a beautiful morning. And I said, yeah, it should be a song. It's a beautiful morning. <laughs> and it is. And I love that about my wife, and I'll say it very briefly, but I do. I love that. She, she takes joy in the simple things, and she helps me to do that too. And that's true. That's the little things that matter at the end of the day, and it's the little things that make up the better part of the fabric of our lives. And these are the things that so often we take for granted. I'm telling you, I have been young and now I'm old, and I can tell you, that your children, if you're a parent, your children, though you're saying, when are you going to grow up? Because sometimes you do. You think, oh, it'll be nice to have the house back. Then one day when they're gone, you wish they were back home. Because somebody's got to clean that house and you don't want to do it. <laughs> Who's going to take out the trash? But it's true. Some of you know this. Some of you have been there. Some of you understand this. Enjoy life while you have it. Tomorrow is promised to no one. And as you grow older, it's true. Your life, if God gives you years, sometimes, and we'll see this in chapter 12, sometimes we don't realize that with many years comes many griefs. Because not only do you have pleasant mornings, not only do you have opportunities to sit in your backyard with a cup of coffee and just enjoy the flowers, but you also bury friends. You bury parents. You lose things that mattered. There are hurts that come, sorrows that come. It's just part of life. And learning how to enjoy your life is very important. You never want to take for granted your blessings there's no guarantee they'll continue. In Ecclesiastes, earlier in chapter 2, verse 24, he said, there's nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, that his soul should enjoy the good in, good in his labor. I saw this as from the hand of God. So enjoy your life. So enjoy the start of a new day. But enjoying the start of a new day begins with enjoying God and having peace with him. Psalm 4 says to us in verses 7 and 8, you filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. I will lie down in, and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. They may have all these things that I wish I had, and sometimes you may feel that way too. You know, they got a new home, or they got a new car, or they have a better job, or they're making more money, they got a promotion. And it's tough sometimes, it's tough to... To, to get two nickels to rub together. Sometimes you wish you could do things. When, when we were young and we didn't have much at all, and, and my kids still remember this, you know, we would leave to go uh, for an overnight, but to give them a longer day and make it a longer period of time or feel that way, Marie and I, we would get them at 3 or 4 in the morning. We'd get them up. We'd put them in the car, and we'd drive all night to wherever it was we were going. Often it was slow. I went to slow. I liked uh, San Luis Obispo a lot. We would go there. But that way, we did not have to pay for a room because I could only afford one night. And, and I still remember getting rooms and, and putting the kids in the bed. And the, my infant, Anna, for, you know, for several months of her life into her first year, if we went somewhere, we would get you know, in the room. They'd have the drawers, and sometimes they'd have a chest of drawers. And when she was an infant, we pulled the drawer open. We got a blanket. We put it in and made it into a crib. See, so those were good days. Marie will tell me this to this day. She'll say, those are good days. I can still remember, we didn't have money to buy hamburgers, right? I mean, McDonald's was gourmet for us. And so we, Marie one time, this is a true story. Marie one time was watching our kids. We had, I think, two of our kids or maybe three at that time. And then a friend of ours left there too. So Marie's walking with five kids through this. We lived on Princeton in Ontario. And she, was, she walked them to the McDonald's. There's a McDonald's over there going towards Grove. Anyways, she walks the kids, and it's hot, and she doesn't realize how hot it is, so she goes into the McDonald's, and when she gets in, she didn't have money to buy anything, so she asked for like a Coke or two so the kids could share it, and the little girl behind the counter pitied this woman and gave her a bag of, of, of food and hamburgers and 
She said, here, baby, you just take it. And I came home and I said, where'd you get all this food? She said, they gave it to me. I said, and we went and paid for it. I said, I, I don't receive things like that. We're not going to do that. I'll pay for it. I'll, I'll pay for this stuff. That's how we were. I didn't know how to rejoice over the simple blessings. And so I was still, I'd say, I'm going to earn these things. And he's saying, no, enjoy the simple blessings in life. They come sometimes infrequently. Sometimes there's more pain than joy. So enjoy the times that you have these blessings, right? We lived in a neighborhood we thought was very friendly. Why? Because one day we were driving and neighbors were waving at us. And Marie says, aren't they nice? Well, we had left our sack lunches on top of the car. <laughs> and they were trying to tell us to pull over. I think sometimes we can have a sense of entitlement that the world owes me something and it doesn't. And my God owes me only judgment, but he's given me grace. And so the goodness of the Lord should be enjoyed in the small blessings too because they come from his hand. And when, for the one who has made peace with God, <laughs> light is sweet and it's pleasant. Waking up and <laughs> hearing those birds singing, and stepping out and feeling the warmth of the sun is beautiful. And the beauty of creation reminds us of the creator. Revelation 4, verse 11, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. He says in verse 8, If a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, yet, he goes on to say, let him remember the days of darkness. Why? He's saying because there are going to be many. And all that is coming is vanity. So Solomon is giving here a, a sober reminder. Life is not filled with continual sunshine. Over the course of a life, sunny days are interrupted by the storms and the darkness. He says, verse 8, notice the days of darkness will be many. The longer you live, the more stormy days you endure. What do I do when I encounter these stormy days? Days of sorrow and pain. Well, sometimes the only thing we want to do is forget the days of darkness. They become the times that you, you don't want to remember. You just want to leave it behind and move on. But we need to remember that long lives are filled with many days of sorrow. You have your trials, your disappointments, your hurts, your afflictions, and they strike us over a, a long lifetime. I enjoy the beauty of God's creation, but I still endure heartache. And heartache often provides a foundation for appreciation of his blessing. So the times of sorrow and affliction are not to be forgotten. They, they, they should be remembered. Why? They refine our character and our faith. And they give us a deeper appreciation of the blessings that God brings. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 90 verse 12 said, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So the more trials you endure will give you an eternal framework. Psalm 103, 15 and 16, As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field. He flourishes, the wind passes over it, and it's gone. And, in, and its place remembers it no more. So fearing the Lord doesn't produce painless living, don't we know it? We all know that sometimes we encounter incredible pain. And sometimes we have affliction. But his promise is, when we go through adversity, the light still shines on us. And we may go through hard times, but God is with us through every one of them. And when we encounter sorrow and loss, it actually strengthens us. It's like what Job said in chapter 23, verse 10. He knows the way that I take, and when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. So our days of darkness are not to be forgotten. They're to be remembered because they provide deep life lessons. Psalm 119, 71, it is good for me that I've been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. So I can understand them, not just intellectually, but I can know them deeply. The things you go through, when you're going through them, remember you're going through them, you don't stay there. When you're going through those things, remember that they are the things God uses to deepen your trust in him. One of my college professors in Bible college said, 
if you want to have deep faith, you will go through deep things. I've never forgotten that. At that time, we used to say, I want to be on fire for the Lord. That was a common saying that we had in the Jesus movement. And he said one time in class, he said, um, if you, you, some of you have said you want to be on fire for the Lord. I'll never forget this. Always remember this. Fire burns and fire consumes. I didn't understand it when I was 23. I do now. Days of sorrow will be many. But God is greater than your sorrow. He gives you hope beyond the sorrow. And so you need to remember that. So, continuing and moving to conclusion, verse 9, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart in the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these, God will bring you into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart and put away evil from your flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. That's interesting. He's saying, first, he says, young people, enjoy your days of youth. In other words, when you're young, your days of youth should be carefree days. I remember when I was in high school coming to conclusion, coming to graduation, and it hit me. I'm not, on, you know, after the summer vacation, all those years that they were really, summer vacation was really for, for us kids. Our parents were still working, not us, sleeping in late, going to the beach as you got older, hanging around with your friends, staying up late at night. And then it hit me. I'm not in school anymore. I'm going to have to get a job. And I didn't want a job. Why? Because it's going to interrupt my days of youth. And so... Enjoy your carefree days because they don't last. Because the, the older you get, the more the problems. Now, he's not saying live without purpose and don't live. He's not saying don't live uh, without moral direction. He's saying uh, walk in the ways of your heart in the sight of your eyes. He's saying walk in the right way. May your heart and eyes, the desires of your heart be proper. He's not saying live in sin. He's saying as long as your desires are proper, enjoy your life. Now, one thing that helps us keep our desires in check, and he makes it very clear, is that God is going to bring you into judgment. We'll see this in chapter 12, in verse 14. God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And so he's saying, just remember to walk in the fear of the Lord, for there is a final judge you're going to see. So don't do improper things. Then he says, and finally, in verse 10, remove Sorrow from your heart. Put away evil from your flesh. When, when he speaks of removing sorrow from your heart, it's speaking of a disorderly way of life. It speaks of sensuality. He's saying these are things that can produce terrible grief and sorrow. Sensual and disorderly living. living. So pursue the Lord. Don't allow yourself to become overcome with concern and worry. Why? Because it leads you into hopelessness. Resist pursuing things that stumble you. Remove sin from your life. Have a sober understanding of the future. Pursue the Lord. Put away evil, he says, from your flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. Vanity, you're not young forever. Time passes by. Age arrives quickly. And it doesn't matter. How many times you get your face lifted? <laughs> and all those injections of Botox so that you have to learn how to express things without moving your eyebrows. <laughs> Sometimes Marie and I get fascinated when we see people we know are older looking so young on TV. There's this one lady, I'll leave her on unnamed, but I, I'm fascinated when I see her because her face is so smooth and her nose is changed and, and she can't smile very well. You can look as beautiful as you want on the outside, but guess what? On the inside, you're old. Yeah, you, you're still old. Yeah, you can, stand, you can try to stand up, but when you stand up, you're still old. 
And so when you're in that, in that, that coffin, they'll say, look how good that corpse looks. You can hardly tell how old that one was. So that's the whole point. He's saying, put these things away. Why? Because youth, you know, thank God for every day that you live, but every day you're living, you're getting older. So be aware of that. You're not, you're not young forever. Age arrives. So a wise person prepares in advance. They use their proper time wisely. They pursue those things that uh, make for a better person, and they resist those things that would make you less. Again, use your time wisely. One day, and we'll see it next week, one day, every young person in this room, should the Lord tarry, right now, you don't get it. And that's okay. Yeah, there's an old Cat Stevens song. It says, you're young, that's not your, that, you're, you're young, that's your fault. Well, you're just not, you're just not aware of it. I was young, I was, you know, I don't, why, why do you complain? Why do you make noise when you walk? Yeah. <laughs> Now I know why. <laughs> so, so, so learn. Well, prepare for the future. Prepare for the future. Because it's not, it's not that far away. It's not that far away. I was, uh, and I'll close with this. I was talking to my daughter, Anna, on... Uh, my wife's birthday. And I said, not everybody knows where they were on February 9th in 1975. 1975. I said, I do. I know where I was. She goes, where were you, Daddy? I said, I was at a Mexican restaurant. I was sitting across from your mama. And your mama ordered menudo. And I looked at her, and I said, you eat that? <laughs> and she says, well, of course. You don't? And I said, I haven't eaten that since I was five. My dad took me to, to the store, and I saw what it's made out of. I, said, I ain't going to eat that. I wouldn't feed it to my cat. And I said... You eat that? She goes, yeah, I do. It's delicious. And she puts a spoonful. She says, eat it. And like a little baby, she feeds me. And I started clapping my hands. And I was, I said, I said, all these years, I've missed this? I love menudo. I love it. You know, so... But that seems like yesterday to me. And I was just telling her that. That was 49 years ago. But it feels like yesterday. And I'm telling you, you don't know it now, but you will. You will. You'll remember things. Oh, I remember. I, I, I was just talking to someone. I, I, I remember when they used to advertise in motels, color TV. And boy, we better go there. <laughs> we had a huge TV when we got married. We had a 12-inch TV. <laughs> and it weighed 400 pounds. And so, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Count your days. They go faster than you think. I was talking, and I'll close with this. I was talking about Dedicating my daughter, Corinne, with Jeff when Jeff Johnson was just a young man. He had black, black hair and a black beard. And now we'll be burying him next week. Count your days. They're guaranteed to no one. And enjoy each one that God gives to you. But don't forget who gave them to you.